well, we can talk about D'Orville, Season 2, Episode 1, Ajaloja. Um, one interesting note about this, I'm not sure I've mentioned it before, but there's always been kind of this conversation in fandom that goes, basically, the question is, original series or next generation? Leonard, from the Big Bang Theory, basically gave the right answer. Well, Kirk, but next generation. The Orville kind of has that. <laughs> it's kind of next gen if someone more like Kirk were actually captain of the ship. So I kind of like that. <clears throat> Gam just says the Orville is nice. Oh yes, I look forward to the Orville. I have decided, because I had such a hard time doing it and found it such a chore last year, that um, I'm going to take Star Trek Discovery. I'm going to do a season finale review. I'm going to do a mid-season review. And I'm going to do a, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a season opener review, season mid-season review, and a season finale. I cannot take that thing that long. Um, on the other hand, Orville, I'm going to be watching that. As you say, Captain Jesse, the Orville is nice. As a non-spoiler on this one, I can say it was fine. It was kind of slow-paced for a season opener. You would have thought they would have gone to something a little more action-y. But the, it was the... Uh, catalyst for the episode of its kind that you know, is kind of goofy um and it's interestingly enough it wasn't all that terrifyingly interesting or even particularly amusing to me um in fact some of the humor on that seemed kind of forced um am i getting used to this show's humor has it changed is it a little more obvious i don't know i hope not i hope not uh, I like the uh, piano in the mess hall. I thought that was nice. But then again, Casablanca is one of my favorite films. And they were using As Time Goes By throughout during that beginning of the end from Casablanca. I foresee a potential problem. Uh, as the Fandai master, um, my, I say in my spoiler alert, which I'll give out, that the problem is nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about a half an hour too early. And here's an example of something like that. Now, the couple that shippers will inevitably refer to as uh, Keddy, I think. Last season, Kelly was wanting to get back together with Ed. Suddenly, she comes up with a perfectly rational reason for not being involved with him that conflicted with most of what she did last year. And while Ed w now wants to get back to her together with her, it's starting to look like a classic Insert a reason for these characters to stay apart until we have the audience begging for it. It happened with uh, Leonard and Penny in The Big Bang Theory. They were together, and then the producers decided it was too soon for reasons. And so they hung them back for several years. And they uh, had each of them interested uh, at a time when the other person wasn't available until basically the planets aligned. And I suspect we're going to see that here. Um, Ed and Kelly are now uh, dating others, and what'll happen is one of them will want the other when they're not dating, and it'll go back and forth until the planets align. I'm terribly afraid that's what's going to happen with that couple. Um, I also see some looming sort of artificial drama between Ed and Gordon, and also over, the, over that new hot chick who is on the show. Uh, and unfortunately, I also foresee the possibility of a romance between Claire and Isaac, at least on her side. Uh, with him, it's not, uh, I'm not really caring in this, him, he doesn't care in the slightest about these things. Uh, this might be maybe a satire on Data in the next generation. In all, this is a decent episode. It is not stellar, but it is decent. Do watch for the shipping to see if I am correct, and as I say, I'm terribly afraid that I am with the couple that must only be referred to in fandom, I think, as Keddy. By the way, speaking of shipping, not everybody knows where some of these terms come from, but again, I am a Fandai master, so I know these things. Always worth pointing out that when you get to shipping, that is the latest incarnation of something that started back probably even before Star Trek, the original series. But fans of the 1970s really made it big. We are. <laughs> if your grandmother or grandfather or great-grandmother or grandfather wants to pretend that they are some sort of bastion of, uh, you know, uh, paragons of virtue, 
Uh, don't believe it. Don't believe it for a moment. We came up with Slash. That was us. At first, it was Kirk slash Spock. That's what it would be spelled out. Kirk slash Spock. Later, it was reduced to simply K slash S. And then, even later, it just became Slash and was then picked up by the entire fanish world. So when you see Slash, well, remember, my young Padawans, people my age were doing that. Yes, we were sick little puppies as well, wondering what it would be like if Kirk and Spock got together. That's us. Again, I would uh, want to push my GoFundMe, the uh, Paradise Strong go, uh, Fire uh, Relief GoFundMe, which is at GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, one word, dash fire dash relief. That's GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong dash fire dash relief. Give early and give often. That's my review for the Orville. It was okay. It was okay. It didn't jump out at me as really knocking me out of my socks. And again, as a Fandai master who has watched, read, and listened to 100 years worth of science fiction, I'm terribly, terribly afraid that I know where this thing is going with Keddy. So I guess I will issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am the Fandai Master. And that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figure it out about a half an hour early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years' worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the century that came before. And you discover there isn't much that's new in the world, which is why watching both uh, the Orville and Doctor Who, my spoiler review said that that kicked in and I saw stuff coming, uh, particularly when it comes to what people are probably going to call um, uh, the relationship between uh, Ed and, and all that. God, I hope they don't do what I see coming. I really hope they don't. Well, let me real quick, I'll go back to Doctor Who. Now that it's aired, and I can talk about it a little bit more. This would be more of a spoiler. So, uh, let me find my notes for that. Pass that. The Orville. Okay, the non-spoiler review of Doctor Who. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got a mediocre episode turned in by Chris Chibnall. It matches the other mediocre episodes that have been around this season. Um, it's mediocre. But <clears throat> I do like the fact that we finally have the Doctor somehow connected to her past. Unfortunately, all the character development connected to her past is also largely in the past at this point, And nothing new was introduced here. And we are continuing to give her and these characters almost no character development. This is, by the way, the second time they've done an episode without opening titles, at least on the screener that I watched. Um, I don't like that. I don't understand why you do it. I don't get that. It doesn't make any sense. Is it time? I don't know. I certainly hope that shutting down Unit is just a crappy pot, plot device because it's outright stupid. And especially since they got the military anyway, it might well have been Unit. You know, even if you couldn't get the actress who plays Kate Stewart, you could get somebody else. You know, I mean, their whole the whole point of you know the, the funding disagreement over unit and suspending operations. That's stupid, considering just what's in the black archives. What we've seen there, all by itself, justifies funding for unit. And has no one, has someone forgotten to tell the UN about all the Zygons that are running around on Earth? There are, like, millions of Zygons running around. There's that Osgood box. Has nobody, like, told them about that? <laughs> you know, that alone, again, that alone justifies the funding. It's stupid. Ah, uh, mediocre, but one Dalek. Yes, well, I'm getting to that. Okay, so the Doctor rebuilding her Sonic with only terrestrial parts in the first episode was, to me, stretching it. This is supposed to be something like a telepathic computer that can do just about anything. Building it out of Earth-born parts just seemed wrong. But when you get a Dalek 
building what Davros always said, the travel device, which is the tank it lives in, out of what at best must be human steel? No, no, I didn't buy it for a minute. Um, and she mentions too, the doctor says it's remnants of its original shell. Where did that come from? It's been like a thousand years. Where did they get the pieces? I mean, was it just laying there at the junkyard? I just, it was too much. It was like, no, no, no. I don't buy that. No, I'm sorry. I also especially did not buy the rockets and the RGB, RPG missiles. And uh, just as a throwaway, I thought that the sound effect they used for the blaster was too much. Too much bass. It's different than what we've seen before. And it's too much bass. I found the stuff with Ryan's dad. Not that great. Um, as always, I like Graham Bradley Walsh. Walsh, I thought he was great. Um, nice and understated. Very good. However, because I am the Fandai master, and because nothing is new, nothing's original, and at worst, to figure it out about a half an hour early, you had the same reaction to the moon being a giant egg. I thought that was stupid, too. Um, if I had been reviewing it at the time, I'm sure I would have called it out. I saw everything coming with uh, the character, the character development for Ryan and his dad the moment that Ryan's dad showed up. And I marked it specifically at 48 minutes and one second. I just, I went, oh, okay. Either he's going to die and everybody will be sad and Ryan will worry about the, that he didn't have a chance or he's going to um, not die, but in some way that makes Ryan love him again. I mean, I knew one of those was coming, but at 48 minutes, one second, I said, okay, one of those two for sure. So, by the way, the doctor says when he's got the microwave in there um, that it uh, makes up for his parenting skills. No, I'm sorry. Having a microwave with you does not <laughs> make up for your lack of parenting skills in this case. Jay says, Doctor Who occasionally just does that. Yeah, they do. Um, they have a long history. I mean, sometimes they get goofy stuff. This one, it just struck me. I was like, wait a minute. Where's a Dalek going to build its exterior shell out of something that's steel? Where's it going to get, you know, rockets? It's just, how is it going to get those rockets on it to fly? You know, it's, it, like I said, the doctor creating her own screwdriver out of earthbound materials. I thought it was really stretching it. This, on the other hand, just broke my suspense of Willing suspension of disbelief. I just couldn't believe it any longer. Dalek fighting military was similar to War of the Worlds 1950s movies. Yeah, in a way, in a way, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I just don't know why they wanted to ditch unit. Why, Chris? Why did you want to ditch unit? Why? It doesn't make any damn sense. It didn't make any, doesn't make any sense from a, you know, in-universe way. And it doesn't make any sense because you use the military anyway. You, you could have had you know, three transports with unit guys show up. It's not like they don't do that. I don't get it. Um, as I mentioned in the season 11 wrap-up, I find this episode mediocre. I found the whole season mediocre. And of all the Dalek episodes we've ever had, this is the one I'm going to remember the least. That's been the case with this entire season. Maybe with the exception of Rosa. But otherwise, if you tell me the title of something, I'm not going to remember it. Thinking, okay, one thing, another, etc. You know, there's nothing really am amazing that came out of this season. A lot of people have been whining on about it being social justice warrior stuff, and I really don't see it. Um, I, I don't see where any any of the men are being particularly degraded, you know. And and Graham is such a good and fairly strong male character. I just don't see it. I just don't see it. What I see is lack of character development, lack of season-long arcs, lack of any real plan, and just mediocre episodes. Larry Larry says, The beam weapon shows their skeletons while vaporizing. That's been the case with Dalek blasters, blasters for a long time. Um, I think you can go back even in the classic series towards the tail end of that and see it. They've also done that thing where they do inverted you know, colors and stuff. Um, but seeing them has been around for quite a while. Um, at least, at least the Dalek got the blaster from somewhere that made sense. <laughs> the rest of it, not so much. Once again, Chris Nib I believe Chris Nibble is not right for this show. He is mediocre at best. 
He doesn't provide much character development for anyone. You know, they need to get rid of him immediately. I know they've signed him for another season. It isn't going to happen for another year. Maybe that'll give him a chance to actually come up with some stories. But they need somebody like Stephen Moffat before Stephen Moffat jumped the shark with Day of the Doctor. Not Stephen Moffat's fault. Where do you go after you have written the best Doctor Who episode ever? Um, but they just need to be rid of Chris Chibnall, and I hope maybe giving him a year off will give him a chance to come up with something that's a little more coherent, makes a little more sense, has good character development, and good arcs throughout the season. Um, let's see, Jay Haley says, I recall the blood-curdling streams people made when murdered by dialects during the Peter Davison era. Yep. Larry Larry says, Jody Whitaker's dialect is a little heavy for me to understand. I don't disagree with you on that. I don't disagree with you on that. In my, the first episode, it took me a while with all their various dialects to really figure out what I was going to say. Um, and there's a, one in the second episode where she says, um, let's get shift on. That for all the world to me and all the commercials and everything sounded to me like she was saying, let's get shit done. I still think so listening to it. Now that I know it's let's get, let's get shift on, I can hear it. But to a non-American, to a non-British person, that sounds like let's, shit, let's get shit done. Uh, Jay says, I haven't actually even watched any of Jodie Whittaker's episodes yet. I didn't finish Peter Capaldi's run yet. She's getting better ratings than Capaldi. Um, Capaldi had a, hit a real low point for Doctor Who so far. She's getting better ratings than I don't think you have to worry about it being canceled or anything. It's just that to me it's generally boring and kind of predictable. It's a problem with being a fan die master. It gets kind of boring and predictable. Okay. Again, I'll push, I'll push the paradise strong. Fire relief, go fund to me. As I mentioned at the top, this is a charity where 100% of your donation goes towards people in need. It is also a tax deductible thing, so you can see on their webpage how to get that tax deductible information. Um, it's on the GoFundMe page, and that is GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, one word, dash fire, dash relief. It is the first link in my description below, and it is scrolling past on my lower third from time to time. That is www.GoFundMe.com slash Paradise Strong, dash fire, dash relief. Uh, that site you pointed me is watching to watch things on is down. Um, yeah, it can go down for several hours, generally, if it goes down. It'll usually come back. Uh, so you saw Capaldi's last episode was very dark and depressing. That's how I found all of Capaldi's era. Um, dark, depressing, even the lighting. It was constantly lit. Very, very washed out. This is uh, totally different from that, which I think is good. But by the same token, if you don't have season-long arcs, if you have only one-and-done scripts, and you're not doing any character development, particularly of the Doctor, it all just looks to me like um, it reminds me of classic Who Doctors. You know, they didn't really get all that much character development. One-and-done, do one episode, get to the next, and so forth. Reminds me a lot like that. And while that was worked at the time period, you know, the time period... Um, didn't, people didn't expect season-long arcs or even that much character development. So when it worked back then, that's fine, but I don't think it works anymore. People have come to expect these arcs and the character development. We're not seeing any of it. It's just, I hope, maybe the thing that people bitch about, they're misinterpreting. I see it as lack of character development. Maybe it's possible that Chris Chibnall just said, ah, it's enough that the Doctor's female this time around. We don't have to do anything else. I hope that's not what's happening. I hope it's just that Chris Chibnall's incompetent. So, not have uh, brain and brain. What is brain? Uh, my friend Gary and I used to sing that. We'd be too tired to think. Yeah, it's also one of the things that goes past my lower third here. Brain and brain. What is brain? It's a mix of, uh, as I'm sure you know, Jay, science fiction quotes along with uh, kernels of nuggets about um, you know my politics. So. No Christmas episode was stupid. I don't disagree with you. Apparently, I read an article someplace where it said they were out of ideas for Christmas episodes. So that's why they... Dude, if you're out of ideas for Christmas episodes and it's your first fracking season, go home and let them find someone else who can do this. 
you are not appropriate for it. <laughs> well, it's about 9.45, my time, which is getting close to the end of the five hours. As I mentioned, if I break 100 subs, I'll make it 6. If I break 200, I'll make it 7. If I break 500, it'll be 8. Above that, I'll use my own judgment on the totally science fictional numbers. Hell, these are pretty science fictional. I um, haven't really seen any giant up, uh, upticks, so. <laughs> yup, Larry, Larry, there are plenty of other writers out there. Yeah, I, you know, it just seems to me lack of character development, lack of arcs, the scripts themselves kind of, eh. You know, it's, it's, it's 180 degrees around from the River Song arc. I was never that thrilled because it seemed a little forced to me. But man, I got to hand it to Moffat, man. He planned out that arc from beginning to end. And the doctor had to go through it all. And I give him huge credit for both making it something that planned out and that all made sense. Doing good time travel stories like that where you have an interconnected woven thing like that is very difficult for it to make sense at the end of the day. But that arc made perfect sense from beginning to end. Handed to, you know, Stephen Moffat, he did that well. This is night and day. There is none of that going on. There's no arcs. There's nothing. Um, you know, like I say, somebody like Moffat before he jumped the shark with the Day of the Doctor. So, uh, let's see. Jay says, I loved her. The actress really got to me. Um, Not sure you're sure who you're talking about there, Jay. Uh, get some sci-fi writers like Star Trek. Yes, I think they need more writers who are experienced in science fiction. Hopefully, one running the show. I don't have any problem with showrunner not writing ninety percent of the episodes like previous showrunners had, but they need to have some guidance. You know, somebody comes in with a good idea, they need to say, "Okay, that's great, write that script." But also, for our character development, you have to work in this and this. But we don't see that. Oh, actress who played River Song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I liked her very much, too. Um, it just occasionally things seemed a little forced. But by that same token, I always like to note, because not everybody seems to catch it, Matt Smith's doctor had very little control over his own destiny. He had very little um, ability to do what he wanted. Everything that he did was dictated by this relationship with River Song and the fact that they were constantly moving out of order. He had to do all of these things, and he knew it starting out that he was going to have to do all of these things. <laughs> I, I just got a kick out of the fact that the, his doctor had very little control over his own destiny. Yes, Alex Kingston, who played River Song, yeah. Funny thing, I went to, uh, they, in, in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, they have a theater attached to a bar where they sometimes will show, and I suspect they did uh, today, they will sometimes uh, show simulcast um, BBC America's Doctor Who broadcast. So I went down there one time, uh, up there rather. I went up there one time and uh, was, I've forgotten who all it was. At one point I was up there one for one episode with my sister, um, her kids, my kids, and me, and a couple of friends of hers all there at the same time. And the place was so cool, they set aside a couple of couches in the front row for us because they knew where we were coming, like Colvin said. So we're leaving, and uh, naturally, of course, it's nothing but Doctor Who fans that are parked around there. And we saw a car that said River Song on the Life is Late. <laughs> so it's about 9.47. With a couple of things I could push tonight, I go ahead, I guess. Husbands of River Song was a good episode. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's what we need to see more of, and we're not seeing any of. It is one and done episodes that to me are predictable. As a fan die master, I can see it coming a mile away.
Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.